And uh, good morning and good afternoon, brethren. Your brethren in the uh, Southern Wisconsin Bible Students Ecclesia would like their love sent to you. Brethren, we are living in very perilous times. In his second letter to Timothy, the Apostle Paul wrote, This know also, this is 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. This know also, that in the last days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. And the NIV rendering of that fifth verse says, having a form of godliness, but denying its power, have nothing to do with them. Paul was not talking about perilous times for the world. He was talking about perilous times for the church. Brother Russell comments, it will not be so much a perilous time for the world. It will be a time of great peril to the Lord's people. Selfishness will be rampant. The spirit of the world surges all around them. That's in reprint 5413. The Apostle Paul is warning the church that all of these descriptions of unholy behavior would be displayed by people who have an outward appearance of being godly Christian people. He warns us that in the last days, at the end of this age, there would be people who would claim to be godly people, and in some ways might appear to be godly people, but they are actually trying to gain something of worldly value, money, power, or reputation. Underneath their facade, their character is morally and spiritually unreformed. We have no lack of examples of these kinds of people today, but let us not be puffed up and think that we are not susceptible to these same powerful influences today that would seduce us to exchange our eternal treasures in heaven for the temporary treasures here on earth. Paul tells us to have nothing to do with these people. We should not be influenced by them. We should not follow them. We should not emulate their behavior or become involved in their schemes and agendas. Paul says that these people have a form of godliness, but deny its power. Commenting on this, Brother Russell says, their life as a whole denies the power of the gospel of Christ to control the heart and regulate, direct, and guide the conduct. There is a parallel passage in Titus 1.16. It says, they claim to know God, but by their actions they deny him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. The peril that I see at this time is the is the spirit and ways of the world finding their ways into the church, even into our Bible student fellowship, adversely affecting the Christian unity for which we are to strive. In Psalm 133, David wrote the familiar passage, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Paul describes this unity in his letter to the Philippians, Philippians 1, 27. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. With what is going on in the world, I have concern that our fellowship may experience new kinds of divisions, not over doctrinal issues or even over personalities, but over worldly ideas and agendas. Secular leaders and leaders in Christendom are sowing seeds of division like I have not seen before in my lifetime. They are trying and succeeding in setting one group of people against another, 
and their rhetoric does not simply disagree with the other's point of view. It demonizes those who hold the other point of view. This is happening all around the world. It is a tactic of developing and maintaining political power. These messages are finding fertile ground in many sectors of our society, and I fear they are finding fertile ground in our fellowship and being promoted. How are they being promoted? Through electronic communications, especially social media. I am not on any social media platform, but Sister Jan is on Facebook. And from time to time, she shows me things posted by brethren. Most are wonderfully inspirational. Some cause me great concern. They concern me because they are promoting worldly issues and agendas. Talking in broad generalities about such a matter isn't really very helpful. So I'm going to mention three examples of messages that have recently caused me concern. I am not mentioning who posted them. I love and treasure all of these brethren and intend no personal criticism of them by referencing what they posted. I apologize if they feel singled out by the examples I cite. And if any of you are familiar with these posts that I use as examples, I ask you to resist any temptation to use my comments as a basis for criticizing those who posted these items. Most importantly, I myself am not innocent of using poor judgment in communication. So I truly do not intend any personal criticism. Our class, the Southern Wisconsin Bible students, studied the book of Revelation for more than a decade. Somewhere between 13 and 16 years, we lost track. We came to conclusions about the interpretation of the symbols and visions in the book that are different from others who have studied the book. We find them quite satisfying, but we are not dogmatic about any of our conclusions. We gladly respect the conclusions of others who understand these differently. But I want to share with you one perspective we had on, on the uh, pouring out of the sixth bowl on the U river Euphrates in Revelation 16, 13 to 14, which reads, then I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. They are spirits of demons performing miraculous signs, and they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for the battle of the great day of God Almighty. When we considered how you get people to come together to fight one, with one another, we realized it happens by dividing peoples, setting them against each other, by convincing them to believe lies. When we considered the levels on which these divisions occur, we identified three primary ways as we looked over past history. And so we assigned these to the three evil spirits. First, individualism. Here I'm not talking about the self-reliant kind, but the pursuit of individual rather than common or collective interests. The doctrine or belief that all actions are determined by, or at least should take place for, the benefit of the individual over society as a whole. This idea says, I am better than you. My needs are more important than you. I will fight with you, maybe even kill you, to obtain and protect what I want and need. Well, this perspective, of course, is a lie. Jesus teaches us to love our neighbor as ourselves. The second evil spirit we think is nationalism. This says my nation is better than your nation. The needs of my nation are more important than yours. We will fight with your nation and kill you if necessary to obtain and protect what we want and need. Well, of course, we cannot embrace this lie. Jesus instructed us to make disciples from all nations. We have brethren in many nations. God's kingdom will bless 
all nations, not just ours. And the third evil spirit we, we identified as religious sectarianism. And this says, my religion is better than your religion. My religion is the true religion and the correct way to serve and worship God. We will fight with you and kill you if necessary to protect the true faith. Now, I want to point out this is distinctly different from being personally persuaded that you are following the true faith of Jehovah. Well, brethren, Jesus gave us no command to persecute or injure others who believe differently. Instead, he told us to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If we want others to respect our right to believe and worship as seems right to us, we must respect others in the same way. The division of people along these lines has been the basis for human conflict throughout history. At the end of the age, all of these will be in play to bring about the gathering to the battle of the great day. I explain this conclusion of our studies in Revelation as a context for the first example of a post that caused me concern. In a recent post on Facebook, someone in our fellowship was advocating American nationalism and patriotism. As prospective members, of the 144,000 who will reign with Christ, our commitment is not to any particular nation. Our interests are for the blessing of all peoples, regardless of their nationality or any other differentiating criteria. And it is important to understand that nationalism is not the same as patriotism. Nationalism is actually a perversion of patriotism. Patriotism is founded and about the devotion to the ideals upon which a nation is founded. It is about embracing our diversity and common humanity and caring for one another as a large community and caring for the resources of our nation. Nationalism promotes the idea that inclusion and diversity represent weakness, that the only way to succeed is to give blind allegiance to the supremacy of one nation or one race over all others. We can be legitimately happy and thankful to be living in the country that we do, enjoying the blessings that come with that. But as a disciple of Christ, we should not be swelling up with pride in our country and advocating its supremacy above the interests of people in all other countries. We represent Christ to the world, whether they know it or not, and we need to reflect Christ's spirit in all that we do, as the Apostle John tells us in 1 John 4, 17. And I'm reading from the Phillips translation, 1 John 4, 17. So our love for him grows more and more, filling us with complete confidence for the day when he shall judge all men. For we realize that our life in this world is actually his life lived in us. Consequently, brethren, we need to be so very careful about what we project and communicate to the world around us as we strive to be good representatives of Christ and his Father. The second example that caused me concern was a graphic that showed an image of a ghostly white face with these words around it. They lied about thalidomide. They lied about tobacco. They lied about asbestos. They lied about mercury. They lied about opioids. They're lying about vaccines. They lied about aluminum and deodorants. They lied about talc hygiene products. products. They lied about hormone replacement theory. They lied about lead and paint. They lied about fluoride. They lied about antibiotics. They lied about saturated fat. They lied about raw milk. They lied about pesticides. They lied about GMOs. They lied about natural medicines. They lied about climate change. They lied about soy. They lied about artificial sweeteners. They lied about LED light bulbs. They lied about mercury fillings. They lied about RF radiation. They lied about glyphosate. They're lying about flu mist. They're lying about statins. They're lying about sugar. 
They're lying about processed food. They're lying about antidepressants. They're lying about antipsychotics. They're lying about chemotherapy. They're lying about radiotherapy. But they're telling us the truth about COVID-19? Now, most people don't like being lied to. So after reading the messages in this graphic, a person might might get a little angry to learn that they had been lied to on so many subjects. And that is the point of such messages, to get people angry. Why? Because when a person is angry, he or she does not think as clearly as when the mind is calm. There is a saying, reason is scarce, or reason is thin, where emotions run deep. Anger and fear are two of the most powerful emotions, and those who wish to manipulate public opinion know this. They have made a science of it. So those are the emotions they appeal to when they want to sway people's thinking on a matter. And so I would suggest we not assist these people by broadcasting their propaganda. The Apostle James writes in James 1.20, for man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. We should fortify ourselves against such tactics, taking Jesus as our example. He could respond as he did to those who sought to provoke him because he remained calm and thoughtful. In the entire biblical record, there is only one time when it says Jesus was angry. He was angry because of the hardness of the heart of the Pharisees who didn't want him to heal the man with a withered hand on the Sabbath day. That's in Mark 3, 5. There are a couple of other aspects of this graphic and message that I believe make its circulation inadvisable by followers of Jesus. One is its attack on some anonymous they. Nonspecific accusations are simply destructive. They are not meant to be corrective or restorative. This approach simply invites divisive us versus them thinking. And another aspect is the offense it may stir up in a recipient. Now, I am a person who is not easily offended, at least not anymore. That wasn't true years ago when I was living with undiagnosed untreated depression. Any whiff of criticism would offend and crush me emotionally. That is no longer true since I have been treated with counseling and antidepressants. I have been taking them for more than 20 years. My life is so much better than before. I tried stopping the medication once and fairly quickly reverted back to my old behavior patterns. I don't intend to ever stop taking the medication again. So when I see a litany of all these supposed lies, I wonder, what is the lie about antidepressants? And who is the they who lied to me? Is that my doctor? And I am probably still alive among you today because of the statin medication I take and my significant reduction in consumption of saturated fats. So again, I wonder, what are the supposed lies about those things? And is my cardiologist the one lying to me? Now, I am not so naive as to believe that no one has lied about these things. The corporations that produce these things certainly have a profit motive. And we know, as an example, the cigarette companies hid known dangers of using their products for decades. In other cases, science has only later identified dangers with a product that were not at first known. But in the end, these kinds of graphics and messages simply stoke negativity and anger. They are created by someone who has an agenda behind them, and we may, know, we may not know what that is. So we should be very careful about spreading them. In the case of this one, it appears the purpose is revealed in that final question to persuade the recipient that COVID-19 is a hoax. 
The third example came to me recently in an email message from someone in our fellowship who I love and appreciate dearly. The email forward, forwarded a message this person had received from a conservative religious organization of lawyers that had its beginnings in Reverend Jerry Falwell's Liberty University. The person in our fellowship was on this organization's distribution list. The message referred to recent data about COVID-19 released by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And it twisted this data to insert, to assert that in fact, less than 7,000 people in the United States have died from the virus. There was a clear agenda behind their message. And that was to minimize the danger of COVID-19. Brethren, my main question after reading the forwarded message and investigating its source is this. Why is this person trusting as a news source an organization that is part of the religious systems of Babylon that teach that a majority of humanity is going to burn forever in hellfire? That organization does not know or teach what God is doing to bring about the kingdom to bless mankind. They have their own agenda, which is definitely not in line with God's agenda. In a similar way, I hear brethren espousing the judgmental and condemnatory messages and agendas of these religious systems, and I wonder the same thing. Why? In a book entitled Vanishing Grace, Whatever Happened to the Good News, by author Philip Yancey, he writes this. Nowadays, Christians devote enormous energy, devote enormous energy to judging those outside the church. How differently would the world view Christians if we focused on our own failings rather than on societies? As I read the New Testament, he says, I am struck by how little attention it gives to the faults of the surrounding culture. Jesus and Paul say nothing about violent gladiator games or infanticide, both common practices among the Romans. In a telling passage, the Apostle Paul responds fiercely to a report of incest in the Corinthian church. He urges strong action against those involved, but quickly clarifies, not at all meaning the people of this world, what business it, is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. And that passage is 1 Corinthians 5, verses 9 through 13. Well, in conclusion, brethren, I want to again emphasize that I am not criticizing those who hold the various views I have alluded to by my examples. We all have views on issues in the world around us, and they are as varied and different as the unique diversity each of us embodies, according to God's calling. My concern is when these issues of the world become so dear to us that we use our time and our talents to promote them to others, to try to make converts to our way of thinking on those worldly matters. Social media makes doing this so easy, and it doesn't invite the thoughtful choosing of our words and expression of our ideas. This is especially true when we post or retweet words that have been formulated by others, others who we might not even know. Our Heavenly Father and our Lord Jesus have entrusted to us the ministry of reconciliation, we are being trained to bring people together through a message of grace and forgiveness. Let us not spend our time spreading messages about worldly issues that tend to divide people. We live in perilous times for the church. Perilous times for those who hope to be among the 144,000 standing on Mount Zion with the Lamb of God. As Paul wrote to Timothy, 
In the last days, there are those who are lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, conceited, and so on. But the great danger of these people to the church is that they will also appear to be godly people, but in fact, they are imposters. And the real danger that these people can do is to divide us, to set us against one another. Divide and conquer has always been one of Satan's most potent tactics. So let us not use the issues and agendas of this dying world order to erect walls between us. Let us do the opposite, as expressed in this saying that I have appreciated for many, many years. He drew a circle that shut me out, but love and I had the wit to win. We drew a larger circle that took him in. And may the Lord add his blessing. Thank you.